On January 1st, 1988, a pamphlet was released entitled, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. Now, what's interesting about this is that that pamphlet um, is listed today on Amazon, but it's out of print. I did chuckle when I saw that. It's out of print. Okay, all right. Uh, (laughs) Church history is littered with failed predictions about the return of Jesus. Uh, What never ceases to amaze me, though, is is how so many good-thinking Christian people can be so enticed, so easily enticed, by uh, farcical notions of the return of Jesus and the end of history. Uh, On the whole, we Christians have been really good at keeping our fingers on the text of scripture and saying what it says about topics like justification and the atonement and the sufficiency of Christ and the inerrancy of scripture. But for some reason, when it comes to talk of the end times, we have theological ADHD. We have a tendency to be suckered into buying end times conspiracy theories. Well, Christian leaders have been concerned about this phenomenon for centuries. John Calvin, writing in the 1500s, urged his readers to make sure they avoided being guilty of excessive curiosity by investigating what the Lord has hidden. That was his term, excessive curiosity, by investigating what the Lord has hidden. So in the strongest possible way, I want to say to you, there is a perversity about excessive curiosity in what the Lord has hidden, particularly as it relates to the end times. Now, there are a number, a number of New Testament passages that discuss the return of Christ. We're looking at just one today, just one. Um, We're gonna look at others in the near future. But I hope that as we go through this particular one, this will serve as a model for you then to go to the others, to find the others, and go through those the way we do it here today, okay? Turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the one we're gonna look at today. 1 Thessalonians 4, let me give you a little bit of background on Thessalonica, the city where this particular church is located. So Paul writes a couple of letters to this church in Thessalonica, church in the city of Thessalonica. This city was some 50 miles from Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus was the dwelling place of the Roman and Greek gods. And so many of these Thessalonian believers probably came out of a religious background where they followed or worshiped Jupiter, Apollo, Mercury, and so on. But they had been marked out to follow the true God. And uh, it's clear that their exemplary faith was spreading throughout the region, and they had become something of a model for others when Paul writes to them. Uh, But even though the Apostle Paul could give them a glowing review, doesn't mean that they didn't have questions. They had questions about a number of things, but one of them taken up in this passage is concerning the death of a believer and how things would end and what the day of the Lord would be like. They were seeking from Paul some reassurance concerning their dead loved ones. Now, what Christian hasn't thought of that? What Christian hasn't thought of that? If you've ever buried a believing loved one, a family member or friend, I'm sure the thought crossed your mind. Where are they now? Will I see them again? 
Well, let's look at what, how Paul addresses this particular issue in this church. Verse 13, chapter four, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So there's an emotional trial going on in this church. There is grief taking place over the death of loved ones. Now, what's interesting about this is the way Paul um, attacks this or goes after this. He links their lack of information with their emotional trauma. I don't want you to be uninformed. You're grieving. I don't want you to be uninformed, so we need to fill in this gap if we're going to address your grief. So he's addressing an emotional problem, an emotional problem with sound doctrine. Paul does this actually on a number of occasions. He, he has an antipathy toward ignorance. Ignorance for Paul is the great bane of Christian existence. On no less than eight occasions in his letters, he traces problems in the Christian faith and life back to ignorance and regards knowledge as the key to many blessings. So he tends to this emotional problem in the church, in this particular church, by arming them with sound biblical doctrine. Now, Paul's reference to those who are asleep is not a reference to soul sleep, as some, as some have suggested over the centuries. Soul sleep teaches that when believers die, they go into a state of unconscious existence, and the next conscious moment they have is when Christ returns and they're raised to new life. Because there are so many other passages of Scripture that teach conscious existence after death, this idea of soul sleep has never gained much traction in the church. For believers to fall asleep is a euphemism. It's a reference to death. Jesus used it with his friend Lazarus and it seemed to be used by the early Christians because they viewed death as temporary. The imagery of death as sleeping is meant to encourage because this death is temporary, believers are not to grieve like outsiders, those who have no hope. Notice that Paul is not forbidding grief altogether, but he does say that our grief ought to be tempered. It ought to be minimized because of the hope we have. What hope is that? Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So our grief as believers ought to be minimized and tempered because we know one who went into the grave and came out again. Now, this is not speculative notion. Paul, does not, Paul says we believe. He does not say, well, we think or we're fairly certain. No, we believe. This is the anchor of the hope. It's the anchor of the hope for those who are deceased, those who mourn over their loss. And Paul then says, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That is, the Father did not abandon Jesus to the grave. God raised him from the dead. So too, the Father will not abandon you to the grave. Why? Because we are united to Christ. His death was our death, his resurrection, our resurrection. See, for the Christian, death is to fall asleep in the arms of Jesus and to wake up finding your home. Verse 15, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So, what are the Thessalonians thinking about? What are they wrestling with? They likely believe that only the living would have the advantage of meeting the Lord in his royal and triumphant return. But Paul is saying the dead in Christ will not be excluded from that grand celebration, but will in fact have a place of honor. Now this phrase, the coming of the Lord, is a technical term. In the original parousia, in parlance today, you hear it as parousia. The term was used in numerous other contexts within the first century world. 
In fact, in those instances, the, the parousia was an event where some sort of official dignitary, often the emperor, would visit a city. And the parousia was an event of great pomp with magnificent celebrations, rich rich banquets, speeches, games, statues dedicated, arches and other buildings constructed, money was often minted at these events. That's the term that Paul uses to describe the return of Jesus. A cosmic festival. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is a noisy verse. (laughs) Three descriptors are used to picture the parousia, the return of Jesus, a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet. The command of God likely announces the return of Christ, perhaps calls the dead out of their graves. Jude 9 names Michael as an archangel, but here the archangel's not named, according to Jewish thought, though. Archangels served as principal rulers over the angels. The archangel's voice is making also some sort of announcement. And the third is the accompanying trumpet call of God. Trumpets in the first century were not primarily musical instruments. Rather, they found their place in military exercises, cultic events, and funeral processions. So the trumpet signaled big things. The parousia, the return of Jesus, is hardly a secretive event. It's public, it's visible, it's audible, it's unignorable. Then Paul says the dead in Christ will rise first. First Corinthians 15, Paul spells out further details about the nature of our resurrection bodies. We looked at that at Easter. But this is what he's saying. Just as Jesus was raised physically from the dead, so too will believers be raised physically from the dead. And the dead in Christ will rise first and be the first to meet Jesus. Verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So believers who are alive at the time of Christ's return will be caught up together with Jesus and believers who have been raised from the dead and all will assemble in the air never to be separated again. Now this word to meet was almost a technical term in the ancient world that described a custom of sending a delegation outside the city to receive the dignitary who was on his way into town in order to begin the Perusia celebration. In Acts chapter 28, verse 15, Luke uses this word in his description of the way a delegation of Christians from Rome went out to receive Paul and his companions as they approached the imperial city. The customary procedure was for the delegation to serve as an escort for that dignitary as they finished their journey into town. Since no other details are listed at this point, it's very possible the Thessalonians would have assumed this to be the case with the return of Christ. Now there's lots of variations within one's eschatology here, study of last things. We might quibble about details when it comes to the how of the end. But at least for me, when the text says, we will be with the Lord forever, I'm satisfied. What else do you need to know? As long as that's the case, I can handle the details, whatever they may be. Verse 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. Let's remind ourselves of why they needed encouragement. The death of Christian friends, the death of Christian loved ones. In other words, Paul is saying the return of Jesus, what you look forward to in the return of Jesus ought to be employed with one another as you encourage each other over the grief you experience in the death of Christian loved ones. 
So when we gather for, for funerals of believers, that should be on our lips. We should talk about the return of Christ. Now in chapter five, Paul keeps talking about the return of Jesus, but he then shifts it to a different angle. And the question is, when will Jesus return? He's described a little bit what what it's gonna be like. When's it gonna happen? Look at it, verse one. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So Thessalonians clearly had questions about when all this is gonna happen. And Paul's response to them is, you don't need to know. You don't need to know. Nobody does. You just simply need to be prepared Paul then uses two images to describe the suddenness of the return of Jesus. On the one hand, it will come like a thief in the night. On the other, it will come like labor pains. The thief is unexpected. The labor pains are expected. Both are sudden and without warning. So there is not a date setter out there who will be able to take away the suddenness of the coming of Christ. You got that? There is not a date setter out there who will be able to take away the suddenness of the coming of Christ. While Christians shouldn't be caught off guard, Paul says everyone else will be. Others will be resting in their peace, security, going about their day when the day of the Lord will come upon them with suddenness and inevitability. Verse four, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So Christians ought not be surprised when the return of Christ is upon us. Why? Because we are not in darkness, Paul says. Thieves come at night when you're asleep and you're groggy and you're not alert, but this ought not to be our posture towards the return of Christ. But what does it mean that believers are not in darkness? Well, I think he answers it in verse five. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So this present world is a place of darkness. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 6 and Ephesians 6. This present world is a place of darkness out of which Christ saved the believer and transferred us into the kingdom of light. And since believers have come into the light of Christ, God's wrath is no longer a future reality and the coming of Christ ought to be a conscious awareness. Verse six, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. The term that Paul uses for sleep here in verse six is different than the one he used back in chapter four. This one is used sometimes in places where moral indifference is being discussed. It is the condition natural to the enemies of Christ, for they belong to the night. By contrast, Christians are exhorted to be alert and self-controlled. To be alert is to be mentally alert, being watchful for the coming of the Lord. While to be sober or self-controlled is used in other places to condemn all kinds of excess. I think one of the ways that we demonstrate we're staying alert for the return of Jesus is we avoid excess. We avoid storing up. Living generous lives could be an implication of Paul's words here. In other words, he's saying, hey, pack lightly. Travel lightly. Verse seven, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. The thought driven home here is to the Thessalonians that those who sleep, those who get drunk will not be ready for the day of the Lord. 
Because of their condition, the day of the Lord will come upon them like a thief in the night. Now this reference to being drunk need not be taken exclusively literally. This word drunk is really the opposite of being sober. And if it's not just referring to the world of alcohol, but referring to the world of excess, excess, then maybe what he's saying is those who are not ready for the day of the Lord are living in a constant state of it. They're living in a constant state of excess on numerous fronts. The Christian, on the other hand, is ready for the day, always prepared. Verse eight, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we meet the great triad of the Christian faith here. Faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope. Verse eight, hope comes last, likely because this is Paul's emphasis in the passage, it's hope. Hope in the Bible, by the way, is different than how we typically refer to it today. Hope in the scriptures is confident expectation of something good. It's not, I wonder if it'll happen. It's confident expectation of something good. There's a, there's a greater note of certainty in biblical hope than we typically think of it. Leon Morris writing on this says, the hope that rests on what Christ has done and reaches forward to the final unfolding of all that salvation means is indeed a helmet for the Christian warding off the world's hard knocks. Both the breastplate and the helmet were defensive armaments, were designed for protection. Faith, love, and hope can ward off temptations to excess. Verse nine, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Up to this point, Paul's teaching has focused on the differences between the character of Christians and the character of unbelievers in the time before the coming day of the Lord. The, the unconverted are not alert to the coming of Jesus, nor are they committed to avoiding excess. But believers who are of the day keep themselves mentally alert for the coming of Jesus, avoiding all kinds of excess. And in verse nine, the, the focus shifts. Now Paul explains the destiny of the two groups. One will suffer divine wrath, while the other will be saved from it. In fact, one of the things that gave salvation a full meaning for the New Testament Christians was that they were sure that they had been saved from, rescued from the wrath of God to come. And it generated in them a deep gratitude to Christ. Verse 10 is a little tricky. Paul employs the same imagery that he did in verses six and seven, where to be awake is to be a believer, but to be asleep is to be an outsider. Here the sense is entirely different. Paul's not saying that all people, whether or not they are believers, live together with Jesus. This kind of universalism is foreign to Paul's thought. Rather, this harkens back to chapter four, verses 13 through 15, where those who are asleep are the dead in Christ who will be resurrected. Those who are awake are living believers and, and, and those who are asleep are dead believers in Christ. And then he concludes this section much like he did the previous. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So it ends the same way the previous section. Encourage one another. How? With this message, with these words. Now, I know people have all sorts of questions about the great tribulation, the rapture, the antichrist, and that other stuff that tends toward wonderful modern day movie making. My concern today is not to teach topics, but a specific text. To put yourself in the place of the Thessalonian believers who were experiencing what they were experiencing. Paul sends them this letter that's all you had to work with, at least for the moment. It's all you had to work with. God's 
divine ordering of things, he said to these Christians, this is what you need. This is all you need. It ought to be enough. If we back up a little bit from the text, we see it's teaching some core things about the return of Christ. It teaches us that Jesus' return will be personal. That is, the very Jesus who died and rose again is coming again. Not some angel or some archangel or some personification of Jesus. No, it's actually Jesus who's coming back. The text teaches us that Jesus' return will be visible. You won't miss it. The text teaches us that Jesus' return will be universal. This is not going to happen in obscurity where only a couple of people notice. The text teaches us that Jesus' return will be glorious. It will be accompanied by a loud command, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet call of God. Be careful about going beyond this. Did you notice why Paul teaches the church in Thessalonica about the return of Jesus? Did you notice why? See, the return of Christ is not taught in the New Testament to satisfy our idle curiosity. It's never done for that purpose. The return of Christ is never taught to satisfy idle curiosity. It is taught for practical reasons. In particular, with this passage, to bring us comfort and challenge. I want to close with this. A couple of reflections. Two settings to use the teaching of the return of Christ. For comfort, for challenge. For comfort and for challenge. First, for comfort. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 The two topics that Paul marries together are the death of believers and the return of Jesus. Just think about that for a minute. Two topics he marries together, the death of believers and the return of Jesus. Brings those together. I'm well aware of Job's miserable comforters. We can be lousy at coming alongside those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We do need to be prayerfully sensitive. But that doesn't mean bereavement automatically makes a mourner infallible. Mourners are sinners too. And sometimes we need the scriptures to teach us how to grieve. Dare I say, sometimes we need Scripture to correct how we grieve. Sometimes comforters need to operate according to the gauges of God's Word, more so than the gauge of the mourner. Paul gets done talking about the second coming of Christ, and in verse 18 says, encourage one another with these words. These believers in Thessalonica, they themselves were in a state of grief, bereavement over the loss of loved ones. Paul says, okay, here's how you handle this. Talk about the return of Christ. Go there. Christian community is meant to be a community of mutual comfort. We really are meant to comfort one another, to console one another, to fortify one another, to encourage one another. We really are. That's what the Christian community is meant to be. How? I I don't think it's simply by patting each other on the back saying, you're so great, I'm so great, we're so great. How do we comfort one another? With these words. With these words. These words. The great truth that he's been talking about, which is the unbreakable solidarity of the people of God. 
See, the great pain of bereavement is the separation that death causes. Underneath it all, when you're mourning the loss of a loved one, underneath it is separation. Separation that death causes between the living and the dead. We see our loved ones no more. We're separated from them by death. What Paul is saying for the Christian, this is only temporary. When Christ comes, it's gonna be a grand and glorious reunion. The Lord Jesus, the dead in Christ, the living in Christ, will be united with one another and will be together forever. So comfort one another with these words. Learn to look forward to the glorious reunion. So the first setting to use the teaching on the return of Christ is to comfort those grieving. The second setting to use the teaching of the return of Christ is to challenge. In chapter five, there's a slight shift from talking about the reality and nature of Christ's coming to how we wait for it. It's gonna happen. Here's a little bit what's gonna be like. Here's how you wait for it. If I was to sum it up, I would say Paul is saying, be ready, act ready. Be ready, act ready. So in light of that, I want to introduce you to Secular Sam. I want to introduce you to a man by the name of Secular Sam. Let me, just, let me talk about Secular Sam. Secular Sam is successful. He has a good job, nice girlfriend, beautiful home. His car is new. His health is fine. He's humorous. He's good with people. He's intelligent. Secular Sam... He's also a Christian, and not just any Christian. He's quite an active one. He has an evangelical background, though he has long ago left behind some of the more embarrassing and immature bits of his background. He's not a liberal theologically. He believes in the authority of scripture, and he's not really a fundamentalist. He's recovered the cultural mandate from Genesis, so he knows that all of life is under the scrutiny of Scripture, not just for religion, but business and philosophy and economics and law. He's even come to see that Scripture is the most satisfying explanation for all kinds of phenomena in our world, from the origin of the world to the meaning of life. Sam can confute his secular friends by historical evidence for the resurrection. He's a student of scripture and he seems to have a moral bearing which if the truth were known would be the envy of many of his more thoughtful friends. But in spite of all of this, Sam is profoundly secular. You say, well, how can that be? If all of this is true about him, how can that be? How in the world can Sam be secular. He's secular in this sense. He expects to wake up in his bed tomorrow morning. That's what makes him secular. Sam assumes tomorrow will be just like today. What makes him secular is he is not ready for the return of Jesus. Are you? On the whole, the American church has done a decent job helping people cope with this life, but has done a lousy job preparing people for the next. Paul uses the coming of Jesus to call believers to be ready. We are children of the light, children of the day, alert, not given to excess that chains our hopes to this fleeting world. We pack lightly. 
We travel lightly. Our eyes are open. What hopes for this world do you need to let go of? What hopes for this world do you need to let go of? Ernest Shackleton is a name that many of you are familiar with. He was the great polar explorer and leader of men. In November of 1915, his ship, the Endurance, was crushed by the pack ice and sank. He and his crew of 27 camped on the drifting ice pack for five long months. When the ice flow began to break up, they had to take to their lifeboats, three of them. One week later, they landed on the uninhabited island of Elephant Island in the South Shetlands. No sooner had they been marooned on this island that Shackleton realized that he would have to go at once for help. So leaving 22 men in the command of Frank Wilde, Shackleton and five others set off in the James Caird, a little 20-foot fragile vessel to sail 800 miles across the turbulent Scotia Sea to the island of South Georgia. Their experiences and adventures, including three separate attempts to reach Elephant Island under relief vessels, are an amazing tale of fortitude and perseverance. Meanwhile, for four and a half long months, Shackleton's 22 men in the command of Frank Wilde were waiting to be rescued. Uncertain whether anybody would ever come to rescue them. By the end of their ordeal, they were suffering from frostbite and exposure and hunger. Shackleton wrote, Wild had held the party together for four and a half months and kept hope alive in their hearts. How did he do it? How did Frank Wild do it? How did he manage to maintain the morale of these 22 marooned men? The answer is this, every morning, Frank Wilde packed up his own kit in cheerful anticipation of the promised rescue and return of Shackleton. He would turn to his comrades and say, roll up your sleeping bags, boys. The boss may come today. And so it is, you and I need to say to one another, Roll up your sleeping bags, sisters and brothers. Wake from your sleep and live in the presence of Christ in expectation for the Lord may come today. Let's pray. Sovereign God, the return of your son Jesus is a promise you want us to know well. It is the reason we can grieve with hope. For one day he will appear with a loud command, the voice of the archangel and your trumpet call. And we, your people, will be brought to him and we will dwell together forever. God, I pray we will be ready for that day where we have chained our hopes to this life, break us free, make us alert and free of excess. Lord, help us to encourage, comfort, and challenge each other with these words, with these words. And we join with the Apostle John And we ask for it. We say, yes, Jesus, come. Yes, Jesus, come. 
in his name we pray these things. Amen.